Hey guys, Professor Bill, Comic Book University, and Extermination Part 2. Sick. All right, so let's get into this. This was a really cool issue. This, this issue didn't exactly have my heart pumping, like, drastically, but it was really good. I like the multiple attacks on this. I love the hit-and-run aspect of Cable, and I love the, the upfront, in-your-face, I'm-more-powerful-than-you attitude of Ahab. Ahab's turning into a pretty impressive character here. I'm digging what I'm reading here. So we got Extermination, part two of five. And uh, the writer is Ed Brisson, artist Pepe Larez, colorist Marty Garcia, and letterer VCs Joe Sabino. The cover art artist is Mark Brooks. Variant cover artists Mike Hawthorne and Frank D'Armada, and another one by Chank. Uh, geez, that's when you say the two names together. Frank Cho. So. Uh, this was very enjoyable. This was really enjoyable. All of this is focusing around the five main X-Men. Of course, you see that bit in the beginning with Mimic, and it turns out that Young Cable has come to take him, but he's not killing. Young Cable killed Adult Cable in the previous issue, okay? That's established. Two weeks ago, hello. But he seems to have taken Bobby. He's also taking Mimic for some reason. Doesn't look like he's actually killing him. Um, so I don't know what this plan is, but I'm getting some ideas. Scott, uh, young Scott and young Gene start having a conversation. I'm digging it. They go inside to have a conversation and all these X-Men of various, um, uh, iterations of the teams are all together. And all of a sudden Shatterstar just bur bursts into the doors like, is it true? Is Cable dead? You know, uh, Shatterstar doesn't believe in too many honorable men and men that he would be willing to fight beside and die for. But Cable was absolutely at the, well, at least second on the top of that list. I think he liked Wolverine more, but, you know, he, he kind of worshipped Wolverine. Either way, um, <laughs> he definitely loved Cable and he would do anything that Cable asked for the most part. So Kitty Pride is here. She's taking leadership. Um, no disrespect to Ed Brisson, but I do feel that he could have done this without Kitty Pride, and it may have been better without Kitty Pride. Because if you are, and make sure you check out my review for Hunt for Wolverine, The Dead Ends, because this actually had a lot in it. Two first appearances, one of a character, one of Hot Claws. So, um, uh, the only X-Man who wasn't really in this room doing anything important, um, that was, uh, what do you call it, that was also in that comic book, Hunt for Wolverine, was actually Kitty Pride, And she was kind of crucial to both issues. I feel that this comic book would have been better without Kitty Pride in it. Just say, oh, she's off on another mission someplace. Last I heard, she was in Madripoor. You know what I'm saying? Just something along those lines. You know what I'm saying? They're all X-Men in here. They can talk freely. They can talk openly and freely. So, I liked... I, I think I would have liked it better if Kitty Pride weren't actually in here. Plus, the leadership aspect here was just thrown in complete disarray, and everybody was an absolute idiot in this. I think that they could have left Jean Grey, adult Jean Grey, in charge while they were waiting for Kitty Pride to show up. But for the most part, Kitty Pride didn't did not need to be in this, and I think that the comic would have been better served if she weren't in it. That's my only criticism of this entire comic book. Literally, that's it. I've got nothing else bad to say about this. This was high intensity, and I feel that the characters were treated very well. All of the other X-Men are, are basically realizing that since young Iceman was taken out of the equation, they've got to assume that he's still alive. They don't have any reason to believe that he's dead. In fact, they should have every reason to believe that he is still alive. Cable was found dead. Uh, what's her name? Um, Bloodstorm was obviously killed right in front of Scott, but Iceman's body was missing. All right, he's MIA. His body is MIA. So that's very different than the rest of the crime scene there. I'm going to take that as he should definitely be alive still. You know, they have no reason to believe that he's alive. They have some reason to believe that he is alive. So I don't think that that conversation should have taken so long. Either way, uh, Gene and Scott are out talking. All the, X, all the young X-Men, the four remaining young X-Men are outside. Sans Bobby. And... Um, there's a quick little conversation about adult Bobby. You know, would I disappear if that one disappeared? Because there's a time when uh, old Cyclops disappeared for a brief second when young Cyclops, when we thought he was dead. You know what I'm saying? So would that, and, and Beast goes on and explains, I think fairly well, in a very good way. 
at the time, the time stream hasn't, uh, at the time, the time stream hadn't fixed itself yet. So it was still kind of interdependent and expectant that the X-Men were still going to be in that time stream. With them gone, this was a direct link to the past. But like anything in science, once you observe something, you automatically change it. This is Schrodinger's law. Okay, this is Schrodinger's law. That's the way it works. Okay, um, once you observe something, you inevitably change it. Okay, and observe doesn't necessarily mean see it. It doesn't. It means that you've tested to prove that it is actually there. Once you do that, boom, all your results are, are, are tainted from that point on. So that has to be recognized. So since they've been out of that time stream, that particular timeline for so long, and in this time stream, we're not sure if young Bobby dies, will old Bobby die also. Okay, so because now the, the time stream will uh, inexorably fix itself. So I like that that was, there was a, there was a, it was a, like a, a Professor Bill light explanation in the comic book. I'm giving what I believe is the direction that, um, Donnie Great, Donnie Cates was, uh, Donnie Cates, that Ed Brisson was actually trying to go with this. I really dug that explanation. I'm just giving a little bit more background to it. Boom. Done. Done. So all of the, the four X-Men come out to, you know, be like, listen, they're, they're talking about separating us. And this is, this is what I mean. Um... Uh, Kitty Pride did a horrible job talking about, oh, we should separate all of the young X-Men. Four different groups, taking them. So you're playing defense. This is stupid. Nobody wins playing defense. That, that's not an appropriate strategy unless you're winning. Unless you're winning. So if you look at like soccer or something like that, oh, we're ahead by a point, everybody on defense. Oh, the bad guys, you know, the, the bad guys. The opposing team is ahead by a point. Everybody on offense, even you, goalie, come. We don't need you down there. They're going to be on full defense. Goalie, we need you down here so we have an extra man going against these guys. Boom. That's the way it works. That's the way it always works. You don't play defense when you're behind, only when you're ahead. The X-Men are not ahead here. There's a horrible battle strategy, and I'd rather have seen somebody other than Kitty Pride make that decision. I'd even be okay with, um, with uh, you know, Gene talking about it and then somebody else coming along and trying to make that decision over her. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I would have rather seen something like that, but either way. Also, they're forgetting that um, Bishop is a time traveler besides, what's his name, um, Cable in here. And Bishop is active. Just go and look at issue number one and two of the, uh, the, the multiple man, all right? So, like, there's a lot that seems to be forgotten here. Either way, Cable all of a sudden shows up outside. Now, this is cool, because unless you're looking for him, you're not going to see him. You're not going to notice him there, because there's a blank spot there. There's a void where he's at. He's using his own tele his own uh, telepathy in order to hide his presence. Love that. So Jean Grey, young Jean Grey, one of the most powerful telepaths, she has she's trying to look around. It's like, I can't see him. I can't see him. I can't see him. Wait, there's a void right over there behind that tree. There should be something there. There's even if there's nothing there, there's still something there. There's air. You have to know there's something there, and and there's a void there. So obviously there's somebody there masking his presence. This is why Jean Grey, adult, and um, I always say Phoenix, but Rachel Grey, Rachel Summers, whatever you want to call her, Rachel Grey on the inside also won't recognize Prestige, the Hound. She's not recognizing there's somebody out there because unless you're specifically looking for a void, you're not going to notice a void. You're simply not gonna recognize a void. That makes perfect sense, loved that. Excellent handling of that. I kind of wish it would have been explained a little bit more, just like, you know, if Gene and, and you know, Prestige would have said like, you know, oh, we weren't looking for that, but we noticed it once we saw the action outside, I did a quick scan and hey, I was surprised there was nothing there. Something along those lines. I think that would have been great. Anyway, um, it's not, uh, uh, Beast winds up getting shot, Angel winds up getting shot, but there's by these little trank darts. Angel goes down immediately. I think that's weird. He's got a healing factor. I think that he should have been up a lot longer than, let's say, Beast. But for story purposes, they needed um, Angel to be taken down. Read the book. At the end, you'll see why. It's another one of those frightening kind of situations. We're going to say one word, Apocalypse. No, he's not in it, but remember what happened when um, with Apocalypse and Angel. Yes, like that. Um, traumatic, life-changing, traumatic kind of thing. That Cable, young Cable, is a butthead. Talking about, you brought this on yourself. Dude, you are evil. Don't care what your intent is, you're freaking evil. But I kind of get it also. Anyway, um... 
Beast winds up pulling the thing out in time and he stays awake so he doesn't get captured. But uh, Angel obviously does. Once Scott, Scott and Gene are over there, they've got that natural telepathic link. Scott turns around and he's like, oh, he's right over there? I got this. And oh my god. The art in this is spectacular. You know what? Anybody who loves Scott, old Scott, young Scott, whatever, just look at that. That's what I'm talking about. That's what, unbridled power. He opens his eyes. There's no, no, no obstruction blocking his view, so to speak. Things blow up. Hell yeah. That's what I'm talking about. These guys all get together and just... They start going after them. Uh, Jean Grey kind of, this is actually kind of funny. Young Jean Grey is there. And it's a beautiful picture. But at the same time, don't forget, if you're looking at this in real life, she doesn't have any of that glowy stuff. All right? So there's no shadow. There's no light showing up or anything like that. It's all telecast. It's all in her mind. You know what I'm saying? So it's a great visual for us. But we shouldn't be seeing light forming around or anything. Like there's, she doesn't have the ability to, for, to create light. So, yeah, there's that. But... I'm going to totally let that slide because I don't care. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm sorry. I, I, I had to get into the scientific mode in order to really appreciate this comic book. So unfortunately, when you see something that goes completely antithesis of science, uh -uh. <laughs> I was going to naturally catch that. So loved this. Absolutely loved this. Um, man, this was crazy. This was absolutely crazy. At one point, Jean Grey says, listen, you're not freaking taking us. You know, old Jean Grey is like, why don't you come with us to uh, to see Rebo? And she's like, see Rebro, whatever, you know, in Atlantis. And she's like, uh-uh, not happening. I don't want to go with you. How dare you try and sideline us? You know, when you think about this, like realistically, and this could have been expanded upon more. When you've got this amazing team of five young mutants who were working for Magneto out of Madripoor and kicking ass and taking names so that they could put them on, you know, eulogies, on, on, on you know, tombstones, because they're killing it out there. All this series of X-Men Blue, 34 issues, the 34th issue came out today, two more weeks we'll have issue 35, the final issue. They've been kicking butt and taking names in space, fighting zimbiots and everything. And now they're like, oh, we got to separate you kids and we got to keep you safe. And shut up. You shut your stupid mouth. Shut your stupid mouth. These kids don't need to be protected. They need to be on the front lines together as a team. You would never separate the uh, original five X-Men as adults. Who the hell do you think you are to try and separate these young kid version of the X-Men when guess what? They're just as capable as the adult ones. Just as capable. I love that they finally stood up for themselves. I didn't like that Scott necessarily stormed out. I guess he was trying to maintain his cool. Scott isn't the leader here, so he can't just impose his will on people. He's always been a hothead, but I get it. He's younger. He doesn't have that situation. You know, like if you're uh, an older person, but you got a baby face, yeah, it's cool that you look young, but you're not going to get the same respect as someone who actually looks weathered, who actually looks like they've been through life. You got that little baby face and all that. It's like, nobody's ever going to take me seriously. You guys who have that know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a reason why I grow a beard. Mm -hmm. So, um... Jean Grey instead turns around and she goes into this very small speech, I want to be with them. And she decides she's going to be with the X-Force team. And then we're going to take a look all the way in the back. This is the next issue. She's with X-Force. She looks like Hope Summers, doesn't she? Except she's Jean Grey. And oh my God. So you know what she basically, what, all that just happened right there, you know what that translates to? Click, click, boom. I love that. I love that. Love young Jean Grey saying, F you. I'm taking charge. You're not the boss of me. You know what I'm saying? She literally takes charge. I love that. I love seeing the strength of any Jean Grey, any age, whatever. Love that. Fantastic. And you might think that I just gave you the entire book, right? Uh -uh. Ahab attacks. Somebody gets turned into a hound. People start fighting and dying. The book is crazy. Go out and buy the book. <laughs> this is a fantastic book, dude. Fantastic book. Go out and grab this. Totally well worth it. Totally worth it. Guys, I'm going to leave you there. Bit of a cliffhanger. Get the book. Professor Bell, Comic Book University. Class dismissed.